see, is it, is there a light? I see it. I, I see it. I see it. Well, Maybe now it says it. there was a problem starting your recording. Please it try it. Usually says it. Don't, don't worry. I, I got I it. Think, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, it says it's recording, so we're okay. All right. Like, like I was telling Sam before we got started, we play it cool and we, we'll make it get through. That's what that's the name of the game. Cool. Okay. Uh, again, welcome uh, to everybody uh, that you've been joining throughout, been listening to our discussions. Uh, this evening, we're going to have a presentation, but what I want to do before we get started is go through a, a couple of administrative points. Uh, first off, this is being recorded. You should be aware of that. Um, I would well, please suggest that you, over. everybody, including the couple of people there now, that if you would mute your. Okay. This will be set to go because I okay. really that I got to see who that is, but. Brad. Okay, if if you would if you would mute throughout, uh, there, there's not going to be any real value for you to have your. Uh, your microphones on uh, webcams you can optionally turn them on or off um, during the presentation I would recommend you have them off only because that reduces the distraction level um, for questions that we're going to uh, take for the for dr. Washington I would ask that you please put them in the chat window you can do that at any time we have some questions that have already been uh, provided uh, that, that have been emailed into us, but if you'll put them in there and then the moderators will pick them off and present them. Um, I see only one caller. Uh, the, the caller that's on the phone, if you would like a copy of the slide, uh, we had a little bit of a technical problem getting the slides uh, available before today. So if you would like a copy of the slides, send me an email now at joeg at ancan.org, and I will send you the link to them on the, uh, uh, the ANCAN database. Okay. And so with that, I will first hand it off to our founder and fearless leader, Rick. Rick Davis, you're on. I don't hear you, Rick. You're talking. There we go. Sorry. I, I had... So welcome, everybody, especially welcome to um, our uh, presenter today, who I have been instructed to call Sam, um, and who um, shares uh, with me, some um, a lot of background in UCSF, which he'll tell you about. So he immediately finds a very warm spot in my heart. Um, the reason I asked for a couple of minutes is uh, just because I truly want to encourage you, if you want your voice to be heard, if you want to make a difference with the doctors like Dr. Sam Washington and others, it's really, really important to fill out the survey that we have recently sent to you. And momentarily, I'll put it in the chat window for you right now. I'm sorry I didn't do it already, but I will. Um, this survey is going to be turned into a poster that's going to be exhibited at the AUA. Um, it's also going to be exhibited at um, ESMO in Europe, but most important for you, it's going to be exhibited at the AUA. And we want the urologists to know how important peer support groups are for their patients. So please, please get it out as quickly as you can and get it back to us because we will be interpreting that data and we will be making a poster out of it. And I just want to give you a heads up. There will be only for UAS guys, not for a, any other sector, a second survey coming out probably in the next three weeks. 
two to three weeks that will focus on active surveillance issues. And that too will be turned into a poster for the AUA and for probably for ESMO, but certainly for the AUA. And again, we want the AUA to understand that they have to take the voice of active surveillance patients a lot more seriously than they have. We want to give you that platform. We want to create that platform and we want, to, we want you to have it and we want the doctors to know that your voice is just as important as some of the other voices they hear from more advanced patients. As you well know, if it wasn't for Howard and us supporting him, um, active surveillance would not have the voice today that it has versus even 18 months ago. So fill out this survey and please watch out for the next survey. They won't take it, more, it won't take you more than about eight minutes. And that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, okay. Rick. And um, yeah, sign, sign those uh, surveys. I get a raise, okay? <laughs> so, I, yeah, I get a I get a telephone uh, book on my chair. At any rate, today uh, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Samuel L. Washington III, or Sam III, as we call him. He's a urological surgeon uh, specializing in oncology, and as we learned earlier, he's at uh, University of California at San Francisco. So he cares for patients with cancers of the genital and urinary organs, including prostate, bladder, and kidney cancers. In his research, uh, Sam studies uh, patient outcomes after cancer treatment, looking particularly at how differences in treatment impact survival outcomes for individuals with genital urinary cancers. Um, he earned his uh, medical degree, well, if you were here earlier, I guess I'm repeating, but he got his medical degree and his fellowship and his residency and all of that good stuff at uh, UCSF. He's, he's now on the, on the faculty there. I, I don't want to overlook the fact that he is a rare person. He has a degree in Latin, so, but I assume everything's going to be in English today. And um, <clears throat> another focus for Sam is geographical var variance in prostate cancer. For example, he just published a study in the Journal of the AMA. And so tonight he's going to be talking about that research as well as other geographic uh, variants that he has looked at. And uh, with, with, well, let me mention again that if you have questions, put them in the uh, ch chat box, and uh, one of our uh, lovely moderators will present them. So, Sam, why don't you go from here? Perfect. Uh, thanks again for having me. Again, I'm Samuel Washington, Assistant Professor, Department of Urology. I'll be talking about regional variation. So, this came from the idea that, you know, anecdotally through my training and everyone else, we saw that people in different regions of the country were getting different care even if they had the same disease, even if they had the same biopsy, everything else, it seemed as though the treatments were changing and it wasn't really dependent on anything specific to the patient or the disease. So this talk will be focused on how does where you live impact active surveillance? Now, just broadly, just in terms of background, active surveillance is a response to over-detection and over-treatment that's been brought about historically from repeated and widespread PSA testing without a clear idea of the utility and prognostic value of PSA on its own um, in that context. Now it's uptake within our community within urology helped pave the way for an upgraded assessment by the US Preventative Task Force on the early detection of prostate cancer. And we know that there's been an ongoing kind of debate between uh, urologists and other groups on the value of prostate cancer screening. Now active surveillance as a whole, the goal is not to completely remove the possibility of treatment, but how can we avoid the delay, avoid or uh, delay the costs in terms of functional outcomes, monetary impact, without compromising a probability for a cancer cure. Now, this is all compliant with screening and treatment guidelines, but it's based on the rationale 
that your initial assessment is reasonably accurate for both the aggressiveness and the burden of disease, as well as your monitoring is accurate and identifies early subclinical progression within that window of cure. So you're not missing an opportunity to provide treatment uh, while it's still uh, curative. Now, people often talk about active surveillance as being an alternative for surgery or radiation, and that's half true. It's really more about the timing of treatment. Now, our active surveillance cohort at UCSF, here's just a little bit of data. Uh, we have well over 2,000 men, average age, uh, a little bit above 60, median PSA of 5.5, with long-term follow-up. And we see that overall, the majority of them are low risk, but we are starting to include kind of an extended criteria, intermediate risk disease. We know that for men on active surveillance, particularly those with low risk disease, they do not uh, avoid upgrade at some point in the future. And that, again, is the goal is to identify this early so uh, we can identify progression before it goes, frankly, outside the prostate. Now, upgrade free survival and active surveillance up to seven years out, we see relatively minimal differences over time between both our Gleason 6 and our Gleason 7 or greater groups. Now, treatment-free survival. Again, we kind of tell everyone that active surveillance does not mean you will never need treatment. And we know that at about seven years, 59% of the people are still treatment-free, but alternatively, that means about 40% have upgraded in some form, either in terms of gleason grade or volume, and have decided to move on to treatment. Now, there's been an ongoing debate of how we identify better triggers for treatment. And again, this kind of goes back to the current limitations of our active surveillance endpoints. A lot of this is based on histology, so reclassification by Gleason score, tumor volume assessed by biopsy, PSA in terms of PSA density, kinetics, and then honestly just the morbidity and anxiety associated with treatment, whether this be the repeated biopsies, repeated MRIs, repeated blood testing, repeated talks about having a cancer diagnosis. So we have to figure out what dynamics of clinical risk change over time during surveillance. And we see that changes in CAPR score, which is our nomogram developed at UCSF, which is a composite of a few different clinical parameters, gives us an estimate of their risk over time. Now, again, if we go back and look at treatment-free survival, we see that for both groups, obviously those with Gleason 6 disease truly um, are more likely to delay or avoid treatment compared to those with Gleason 3 plus 4 or greater. But we still see in both groups the overall survival as well as cancer-specific and metastasis-free survival are well above 95%. Now, the impact of new technology. Now, updated NCCN guidelines have talked about genomic testing. Um, and strata, based on risk stratification and life expectancy, we talk about the utility of genomic testing in each of these groups. So this is just a brief table showing that kind of breakdown here and how we've implemented different types of genomic testing into our treatment algorithm, particularly in those who may be amenable to active surveillance or those who may be on the fence where they're not sure about active surveillance versus treatment. Now, Oncotype DX is one type. There are many of those. I'm um, just pointing out one specific one, but not endorsing any over the others. But we see that each of these tests have some proprietary combination of, in this case, 17 gene RT uh, PCR assays um, and those are compiled in a way that is prognostic of multiple clinical endpoints. Now, we know that CAPRA, again, that was our nomogram, nomogram based on clinical uh, parameters. And our GPS, our genomic test, there's a poor correlation between these. And that is okay because it provides new information that combined with our clinical parameters can give us a better estimate of a person's risk. And that is the underlying goal of any of these genomic tests. Now, if we were to look at one of these genomic tests, in this case, GPS score, uh, we see that for every five unit increase in that score, we see an increased risk of upgrade to three plus four in those initially diagnosed with Gleason 6 disease within our active surveillance cohort. Now, we also see that this GPS or these genomic classifiers, these genomic tests, also help us predict the likelihood or the risk of patients having adverse pathology, so T3 disease, primary Gleason 4 disease, and or nodal disease at time of prostatectomy, so in terms of their surgical pathology. And it also gives us some insight in terms of their risk of PSA relapse or a detectable PSA 
or risk of secondary treatment after prostatectomy. Now, there are a lot of concerns with genomic classifiers, particularly in terms of tumor heterogeneity. So if we're sampling one focus and tumors multifocal, how representative is the sample that we have compared to the whole? Are all, benef all patients going to benefit from this? Are very low risk patients going to benefit or is it better in the patients who are low or favorable intermediate risk where we're on the fence between active surveillance versus treatment where we may see more benefit? Overall, are they cost effective? Are they saving us uh, time? Are they avoiding you know, uh, treatment for some duration? And then what are the long-term outcomes if we were to base our practice entirely on these genomic tests and classifiers? Now, overall, there's ongoing debates, particularly as we introduce more genomic testing, as we talk about other groups potentially being incorporated into active surveillance cohorts, how do we accurately categorize people's risk? Do we look at very low risk, low risk patients based on NCTN criteria? Do we look at low CAPR scores based on the nomogram developed in UCSF? How do we include those with Gleason 3 plus 4 disease? Is it safe for African-American men? That's an ongoing debate. Um, and particularly, how do we carefully select these men and are eligible men being initially managed with active surveillance rather than active treatment? And that's where we start to see a lot of variation. Now, prior studies have shown that active, uh, excuse me, that uh, African-American men, race alone is not associated with upgrade or upstaging. Now that was confirmed in two different registries, both the capture registry from UCSF as well as search looking at VA data. Um, now we see no, associ no significant association with African American race, uh, pathology upgrade, staging, or surgical margins. This was confirmed in a recent uh, cancer paper as well that combined data from uh, Hopkins uh, University of Washington, I believe Michigan, three centers, um, also showing that race alone by itself did not impact care. Now, is it associated with an increased risk of reclassification? We look at Canary, another multi-center active surveillance cohort, and we do not see differences, you know, not the best copying I've ever done in terms of these figures, uh, but we see no differences here between uh, African-American men and white men in terms of reclassification over time, as well as treatment-free survival within these cohorts. But again, all of these cohorts speak to uh, appropriate and tight implementation of active surveillance. Now, what about those men who have Gleason 3 plus 4 disease? We know that basing it just on cancer risk, basing our cancer risk just on the Gleason score by itself is not a comprehensive way to assess risk. Um, and we know that for men with, um, who are considered for prostatectomy, the benefit may be marginal in those with higher risk disease, more aggressive disease, particularly those outside of the prostate. Um, and we know that Gleason 3 plus 4 alone may add very little risk, even when we look at it in terms of our CAPR score or risk nomogram. And that's why we really need to incorporate not just Gleason grade, but volume as well into our kind of risk assessment um, in terms of predicting adverse pathology at time of surgery. Now, again, going back here, again, we see minimal differences in terms of treatment-free survival between these groups in carefully selected men with Gleason 3 plus 4. At UCSF, even in these groups, those who are on active surveillance with a diagnostic Gleason score of six or seven, we do not see differences in terms of uh, outcomes up to seven years after prostatectomy. Now, what other triggers can we think of for active surveillance for this group? Well, a high PSA density, again, that's the PSA, volume, uh, PSA divided by the volume of the prostate. The incorporation of MRI now out, uh, allows us to incorporate that as another uh, imaging-based biomarker or assessment of risk. So those with PIRADS-5 uh, lesions noted on multi-parametric MRI. Those who have adverse genomic tests, we've even started to look at within the Gleason-4 uh, category, expansile cribriform or other Gleason-4 subtypes may confer greater risk of uh, aggressive biology compared to others. And then obviously looking at the volume changes over time in serial biopsy. Now this leads all of us, you know, all these factors kind of feed into how people describe active surveillance and how they implement it in their own practice. But we know that that is not uniform across all urologic centers over the country. So 
there's been a lot of discussion and a few studies looking at how practice patterns have changed over time. Now within UCSF, we took a look at this and we saw that on the left side here, you can see that clinical risk for those who went under, uh, underwent radical prostatectomy, over time, you see a lot smaller proportion of men with low risk disease undergoing prostatectomy. And as one would expect, a larger portion of those with intermediate or high risk disease um, going on to surgery. That's because a lot of these men, as you see on the right side, the majority of those men with low risk disease are now being managed safely with active surveillance. And this goes up to 2018 in terms of our most updated uh, figures. Now this was even looked at within the VA system itself. Um, there's been no validated measure of active surveillance within the VA. So oftentimes it's kind of attributed to or lumped together with conservative non-surgical non-radiation treatment. But they saw out of more than 20,000 patients diagnosed from 2010 to 2016 uh, with these clinical characteristics, they looked at how many of those men underwent active surveillance or watchful waiting uh, compared to curative therapy within one year after diagnosis. And they saw that overall, similar to what we saw in other cohorts, active surveillance or watchful waiting in this sense, uh, conservative management was increasing over time, going from 51% in 2010 to 2016 of all VA centers included. We saw this increase primarily in the terms, in terms of uh, active surveillance over time in our broader kind of US population. So despite this overall increase in the utilization of active surveillance, when we look specifically within facilities, you see broad variations in the uh, likelihood of uh, being managed conservatively for your low risk prostate cancer. And that ranged from uh, regions reporting 35% utilization to 100%. And what other studies have noted is even within the VA, you see geographic variation after controlling for clinical characteristics, sociodemographics, are independently associated with the likelihood of active surveillance. You see, so you see even in South versus West, Northwest and Midwest, uh, the odds ratios or the likelihood of, uh, frankly, the odds of you um, being managed with active surveillance are quite different. Now we see that overall across the country, on average, utilization is increasing, but we see these variations are quite broad by region and likely driven by many different factors. There's a separate study using CR Medicare data, this one a little bit farther back from 2004 to 2007 with over 45,000 men. Again, even going back to 2004, they saw that the use was increasing. But again, they couldn't pull out or distinguish active surveillance from watchful waiting. So they saw men of uh, advanced age, particularly those who are over the age of 80, in which case we wouldn't necessarily talk about screening in general. Uh, were at much higher odds of using conservative management. Similarly, we saw consultation with medical oncologists within these same groups were also increasing. Interestingly enough, we saw there was less consultation with radiation oncologists, um, but I'll, I won't touch that. Now, when they looked at what factors are contributing to active surveillance use over time, oddly enough, for active surveillance, so that's kind of the green group here, patient demographics, uh, caused somewhat variation or a little bit of variation. Here they noted region and year had little impact on it, which is odd based on later studies. Um, and we see these unexplained factors contributing to it as well. And these unexplained factors, both in terms of the surgeon and the patient, may be contributing to uh, the variation that we're seeing based on region, but it's unclear because no one has that granular data. Now, looking at the relative contribution of additional factors, if we were to look at what's encapsulated in this unexplained group, 58% of those were patient-related factors, 12% demographics, um, not commonly measured. Other consultations and surgeon factors were nearly a third. But we see, again, even within CR Medicare data, region, as we had seen within the VA, is also can independently associated with variations or your uh, impacting your likelihood of active surveillance over time. Now, this brings us to the study that I did uh, with Dr. Carroll, Dr. Cooperberg, and others um, that was published uh, back in December. There have been a few studies looking at active surveillance over time, and they noted variation differences by race and, race and ethnicity. Uh, what we wanted to do in this study was use a new 
prostate uh, with watchful waiting database that had an intent in a validated measure active surveillance watchful waiting uh, to look at this in a more granular way. So we looked at variations both between county and SEER region um, in terms of active surveillance use across the United States. To do this, we combined SEER data from this prostate watchful waiting database as well as county area health resource file data. So granular county level measures of patient education, income, as well as health resources available. So number of urologists, number of primary care doc, number of radiation oncologists within that county. And then we kind of layered these in a clustered fashion to examine regional variation. So across different counties and across SEER regions, how is the likelihood of active surveillance versus active treatment changing? Now this had uh, nearly 80,000 patients, again, with clinically localized low risk disease. So prime candidates for active surveillance across 17 SEER regions. This data in terms of what was available for this analysis was 2010 to 2015. So it's still a lag of about six years, um, but we saw that this was a, kind of a greater representation or more consistent with the general population. The majority of these men though were uh, privately insured and the large percentage of them had T1 disease, but we see a median follow-up of well over three years. Now, overall within this data set, active surveillance utilization was low, it was 22% across the board nationally. But again, that's an average. So when we break it down by geographic region, we see broad variation going up from 42.2 and 33.9% down to 4.1% and 9.3 in different areas of the country. Now, this plot is kind of busy, but I just want you to focus on the red portions here. And what you see is on the top, clustering by region. And on the bottom, you see time. So what you see is these red marks over time increase. So we're seeing a general increase from a 13.1% in 2010 to 32.5% by 2015 in each of these different regions. If we were to look at kind of the average percentage increase by region, we see it ranges broadly from 6% in New Mexico to 81% in New Jersey. So the uptake is very rapid, but we're still seeing it take some time, even over this time period, for that uh, utilization to get to where we want it to be. Now, again, if we were to go down even further down to the county level, so not just the SEER geographic region, but within counties themselves, we see a similar thing here. Again, the red parts are what we really want to look at. And you see that there's broad variation across counties in terms of active surveillance. We see that some counties, there was no active surveillance utilization, despite having patients who were eligible candidates, and that ranged up to 100%. So we saw similar trends in terms of the national extent or degree of variation. But again, we saw this pattern of incremental improvement even at the county level. But this county level variation is almost kind of masked or hidden when you only look at the national level. Now, again, going back to local, focusing on these SEER registries. Here, it's kind of a busy slide, but basically what you wanna see is over on the far right. We see an annual increase in active surveillance utilization over the five-year period of this study. And we see it, again, ranges from 7% up to 75%. Now, some of that's due to other places like San Francisco, we adopted active surveillance early. So our margin, our kind of potential gain is going to be smaller but you see much broader impact or uptake um, in places like New Jersey, where you see a broad, broad uh, increase in active surveillance uptake over this five-year span. Now, within our study, within this clustered analysis, we saw that variation just across SEER regions accounted for about 18% of the total variation we were seeing across the country. We saw that when we started to add in more county-level factors, it reduced it minimally, down to 17%. We saw that age, year of diagnosis was associated with active surveillance use. So those who were diagnosed later, uh, understandably, were more likely to get active surveillance as opposed to active treatment, as well as those who are older, more likely to get active surveillance with watchful waiting compared to those who are younger. We saw, interestingly enough, county level factors like median house income, education, provider density was not associated with active surveillance use. And interestingly enough, we saw differences by race, race ethnicity that had not previously been reported or had been uh, in association had previously been reported that we did not see. And a lot of that we have to attribute to just differences uh, in the analyses themselves 
as well as us adding many more kind of granular data points um, that may have explained part of that disparity that was seen before, particularly uh, within uh, black and white comparisons that have been noted previously in terms of active surveillance uh, uptake that were not seen when we started to add in county level factors themselves. Interestingly enough, another group, Hispanic men, who were not commonly evaluated in a lot of these studies, were still found, even in our analysis, to have 25% lower odds of active surveillance compared to white counterparts with similar disease characteristics. Now, overall, active surveillance continues to be kind of the preferred form of treatment for men with very low, low risk in select patients with favorable and intermediate risk disease. Particularly with the implementation of new technology, MRI genomics, we can make it safer as we improve our risk characterization and risk stratification for these patients. But we still high degree, we still see highly variable utilization across the United States. And it's unclear whether the introduction of new technology will decrease or increase the variability based on access to MRI and genomic testing. And then I just obviously want to thank everyone who was involved, as well as my mentors, Dr. Carol Cooperberg, uh, Michael Leitman, who was my prior fellow, um, and all the others. Well, my turn. Yeah. Okay, I'm ready. Um, let me point out to the audience that if you have questions about uh, geographic variants or Latin, um, <laughs> You know, you know, feel free to enter them in the chat room. But Dr. Washington is also willing to field questions in general about uh, prostate cancer and active surveillance. And I, I'm going to uh, kick it off myself with a question. I noticed um, the variability between the different VAs and, you know, going from 35% to 100% or something like that. And I wonder, you know, how do those rates compare to the rates in the communities at large outside the VA in those communities? Yeah, so we still, there have been a few studies looking at, um, say, within the music group within Michigan, there's still mm -hmm. broad variation. Um, we're still seeing at the practice level and even at the individual level, pretty broad variation when you're comparing people even within the same practice. I think uptake within the VA system um, is a little bit better than the general population, but again, it depends on the region. Um, and part of that difficulty is that with they, there's no clear kind of active surveillance variable. Um, so oftentimes you end up with a proxy of conservative management, so not surgery, not radiation. Um, people are trying to work on getting a better variable for that and there have been a few studies that have attempted that recently as well you know i think uh dr stacy Loeb published mm -hmm. a study not too long ago and it was a national look at um at the vas and yeah I, I, and you know don't don't trust my memory here but my memory says that she found that um that the percentage of candidates who went for active surveillance in the system overall was something like 70%, mm -hmm. which is, you know, pretty high for any place. Yeah. But the, much higher, you know, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was going to say much higher than particular regions within this country, right, um, in the general population. I would say, um, you know, compared to academic centers like UCSF or Hopkins, you know, it's comparable. But um, if you go out to rural, any part, you know, you're going to see a broad difference there, adjusting for the number of patients, of course. Yeah. You know, considering the, the, these variances, um, two things. Can, can men find out what their local rates are? And then from a practical point of view, what, what can they really do about it? Are they going to move just, uh, you know, to, to get the right uh, prostate care? Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. So um, it's tough to know if you're, say you go into your local urologist, unless they're monitoring their own practice and looking at their own data, they may not have a clear sense. They can kind of guesstimate. I could guesstimate, you know, even with my own practice, uh, the number of men on active surveillance, but I don't have objective numbers. 
I mean, well, I can get objective numbers, but they need to be collecting their own data. I think for men who are interested in active surveillance, being their own self-advocate is, I'd say, one of the strongest factors that are modifiable because some of this may be just due to provider hesitancy on implementing active surveillance. Um, and if someone's interested in active surveillance, um, but their urologist may not be, it's worth further discussion or a second opinion to see whether or not they are good candidates. Um, and it's just something to uh, consider definitely before proceeding with treatment. Uh, let, let me ask you this. I mean, there's the uh, different um, percentages of candidates who, who opt for active surveillance, but you know, you know, what is the right number? How, how do you know, you know, that the higher number, well, I mean, or, you know, or the lower number of mm -hmm. men is, is the correct number? Yeah, it's tough to know. Um, and I think that you can't know, even in some men, whether or not they're good candidates just with that first biopsy. Uh, even now we try with genomics, we try with MRI. But we still see men who are reclassified, you know, a year out from their initial diagnostic biopsy. So I think that number is always involved, evolving. You know, if I speak to some of my mentors, they want every person with low risk disease to be on active surveillance for some time. Knowing that the initial biopsy may be not the most representative, either due to sampling or, you know, just a small focus that just wasn't hit uh, the first time or the first biopsy, even with MRI which again goes back to just sampling um, in the need for um, a, a confirmatory biopsy. You, know, you mentioned uh, the men with intermediate, uh, low risk intermediate disease, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it, maybe you can remind me, what, what is the breakdown? If you look at 100% of men who are low risk or favorable intermediate risk, what, what proportion do they make up of the total population, you know, newly diagnosed in a year? Yeah. Hmm. So I'd say it, you know, if we were looking just at our active surveillance cohort, you know, about 15% of them were intermediate risk based on CAPRA. Um, overall breakdowns, I'd have to look at the most updated numbers of that, actually. Um, and I probably have to look within AQUA to get a sense of how many um, patients are being diagnosed with that most recently. I'm off the top of my head. Well, you know, what I'm getting at is, you know, these two groups, do they make up more than 50%? Do they make up a majority of men who've been diagnosed, newly diagnosed in a year? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd say the majority of men are diagnosed with low risk disease, just broadly. Um, and then there's that subset, you know, we often quote 20, 25%. Um, some people say other numbers have more aggressive disease, of which, patients with Gleason 3 plus 4 would be grouped within that. Now there's a subset of those with Gleason 3 plus 4, but a small proportion of Gleason, of, uh, Gleason 4 disease, small volume, you know, a smaller subset with favorable Gleason 4 subtyping um, that would be candidates for a kind of extended criteria active surveillance. But that is even, even that is kind of a fairly relatively new concept. Um, that's starting to have a growing uh, body of literature behind it to show it's safe and carefully selected men with favorable intermediate risk disease. Now, this is a little over to the side, but it does relate to uh, these intermediate, uh, favorable intermediate risk men. Mm -hmm. I, wa I was uh, on a program uh, and sitting next to me was uh, Dr. Hamdi from, from UK, you, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he told me his forecast for the future was that uh, actually the Gleason 6 men ultimately, you know, are not going to be in active surveillance. They're, they're just not going to be, you know, dealt with. They're going to go along on their merry way. Yeah. And he felt that, that active surveillance <clears throat> was primarily going to be for men with favorable intermediate risk. So do you have any thoughts about that? I could definitely see things heading that way. So even if you look at our genomic testing, the primary outcome is your risk of having greater than or equal to Gleason 3 plus 4 disease, say for one test. MRI, you know, we look at pyrads lesions, 
trying to identify those who have Gleason 3, 4, 3 plus 4 or greater. So, you know, it's trying to selectively identify those with high risk disease and almost ignore uh, or not identify those with low risk disease. So in that sense, you are kind of culling the Gleason 6s out of the actor surveillance pool of potential candidates. Um, and then you're just kind of substratifying the Gleason 3 plus fours from those who need treatment, which would be four threes or greater. Yeah. So well, I can definitely let, see let me encourage everybody in the audience to save my voice which is fading and, you know, put questions into the um, chat box and our lovely uh, moderators can dive in. And I'd be happy to hear from the, some of the moderators too, but I, you know. Sure. I, Howard, let me, Howard, I'll jump in and get one for, uh, for Sam. Um, yeah. So we've got uh, one that came in and says, if provider density, education level, median income, are not found to be significantly related to differences among counties, then what are the best expla explanatory factors of variability at the level of analysis? Yeah, so it's it's tough because there are a couple things, you know, we could just get counts of the number of urologists, number of radiation oncologists, but that doesn't tell us anything about the discussions people are having, right? And I think at the end of the day, the literature, when you look at patients who are deciding between treatment or active surveillance, the content of those discussions is so important. And that's where the urologist provides all the objective data, but can also give guidance. And that guidance can steer patients one way or the other. No judgment in either direction, but I think it definitely can if a person's on the fence or if they're hesitant about active surveillance, reassuring them or confirming their uh, reservations can tip them in one way or the other. And that was just something we couldn't measure in these. It, the data just wasn't available at this scale um, with this type of analysis. Have you looked at, have you looked at all at, or in any of this as to the age of the urologists and the age of, I, I would think that would have some factors in. We can probably just take a, a look at regional population age and make some assumptions there. Exactly. You know, I, I don't want to say anything to uh, tick off my mentors as one of the young urologists uh, new to the field, but I definitely think that, um, you know, I talk with Dr. Carroll about this a lot. Um, he talks about it's not age being a proxy for how receptive one is to new technology, and he doesn't think that there's a correlate there, but I think age could be a proxy in some areas for that. Right. But I definitely think how willing people are to incorporate MRI and MRI fusion biopsies, to incorporate genomics if they can, um, may definitely impact the willingness to promote or encourage active surveillance for their patients. Right? As well as, you know, if they trained in the area of operating on Gleason 3 plus 3 and seeing reclassification of prostatectomy, they may not be inclined to do active surveillance for those patients out of that same kind of concern that they've seen over the last 20, 30 years in the practice. Yeah, so uh, we've had some questions. So what does somebody do if uh, they find themselves in an area that really has low active surveillance? Yeah, it's a tough question. I think um, it was a little bit tougher pre-COVID, um, oddly enough. Because I think one of the benefits, well, I'd say the only thing that has improved was the our need for telemedicine. And with that, it really broadened up the ability of patients to reach out to people in other regions of the country even for a second opinion. And I would say, you know, even patients that I see who have reservations about access to treatment, I say they should talk with someone else. But I think now doing it via Zoom, if you're on the East Coast, you can talk with Dr. Carroll. You're on the West Coast, you can talk with providers on the East Coast, and at least get some feedback from a different person. No judgment on what's being discussed, but it's just another set of eyes. So Sam, how do you do a digital exam on uh, telemedicine? Ah. <laughs> we save it for the biopsy. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just try to make sure they don't attempt, you know, to show me anything they don't need to on a webcam. Thank you. Howard, that's that self-examination kit I found. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's um, a good idea. We're going to make our fortunes. <laughs> what? 
Um, doctor, what would your, what is your kind of, your standard protocol to put patients or to have patients, suggest to patients to go on active surveillance? Yeah, well, you know, there's been a shift in our practice overall with the incorporation of MRI. A lot of times MRI happening before that diagnostic biopsy. Um, but we are incorporating MRIs in our active surveillance protocol. So um, assuming patients would, you know, start to come back into clinic as opposed to virtual visits, we'd be still doing our PSA several times a year, incorporating staging ultrasounds, biopsies every two years, MRI every one to two years. And then probably, depending on what the results are, genomics, consideration of using genomics after the, each of those biopsies. You know, intervals have changed a little bit as we've kind of avoided um, patients coming into the hospital in the setting of a pandemic. And as we actively try to de-intensify the number of tests and procedures for active surveillance as a whole. Are you using uh, micro... Ultrasound. Yeah, so I've seen a few centers start using the micro ultrasound. Um, we've not used it um, at UCSF just yet. Um, but just we also have Dr. Shinohara. So. Is that because you don't have them? You don't have that? Yeah, we haven't been using it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are they, are the economic, well, the economics of the micro ultrasound is, is they don't aim to sell it to hospitals per se. They want to sell it to people, office practices. Does, does they, is that a factor at UCSF? In other words, um, are you, are you going to go out and buy one? I uh, have not uh, heard any discussion of that uh, recently. But um, what we have started doing at UCSF is more, this is kind of a separate topic, but in terms of focal therapy, how that could work into men who are on active surveillance and say have one localized area of more aggressive disease. Could we treat that area and then continue to keep them on active surveillance? Uh, which is an interesting yeah. idea. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about men in rural areas. Um, in your research, have you teased them out to, you know, I mean, the gut, my gut tells me that the men in rural areas ha have less access, you know? Uh, we have a guy, a guy on the call today, he's a farmer in, in uh, Kansas, and, you know, he didn't have easy access to an MRI, you know, you know, that the closest MRI, I think, was five hours away. He ended up going to St. Louis, which I think is six hours away. So, I mean, what, you know, what, from your own research, have you found anything out about, about access for, you know, rural counties? And uh, is my gut feeling right that they don't, they're, they're less likely, men, they're less likely to ha be on active surveillance? No, I think your gut is right, because those same men are at higher risk of kind of these other aspects of burden due to cancer care. So travel times, you know, time off work, you have to spend a whole day off of work to come to see a urologist for active surveillance. That impacts people greatly. Um, in our study, we saw differences. So the rural areas were less likely to uptake active surveillance. And some of that may be due to just resource availability including urologists, um, MRI machines, you know, in this case, MR fusion ultrasound biopsy capabilities. I'm um, just not available in some of these regions without people driving five or six hours. So, I mean, in you know, what can be done? Well, like I got a phone call from a guy from Coal City, Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's in the boonies from the boonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the guy, you know, managed to get up to Chicago and, you know, hit a reasonable uh, standard of care. But, you know, other men in his community were not getting the same care. You know, some of them were in identical situations to his. And, um, you know, they, they, they had an old, they had two urologists in the community and one of them retired. Mm -hmm. And the one who was left was older, and I don't think I don't think he ever heard the words "active" and "surveillance" in a sentence. So, so, I mean, what do you you know? What do you do? What can be done about these rural men? 
Yeah, so I think that is where, you know, so when we talk about rural men, when we talk about racial disparities, each of these, the specifics have to be focused on the region, right? So I think if we gr group all rural men together, I don't know if we'll be able to make as much of an impact compared to say us focusing on men in rural Texas in what local factors may be inhibiting or impeding their ability to get active surveillance, right? So I think the greater idea or concept behind this is that these small area variations can direct very local directed intervention. Um, so like what may work for patients that we've seen come down from Ukiah may be different than those who live, you know, a couple hours from where I grew up in Texas. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. Other than just saying get more urologists who are, you know, up to date, because I don't think that's you know, gonna happen. Oh, really? Quickly, quickly. quickly. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I mean, go, go ahead. No, I was just going to, uh, Rick had asked the question here um, uh, at UCFS, um, when you had, uh, when your active surveillance cohort was about a thousand, Dr. Carroll used to say that uh, one third the men yeah. remained on active, one third opted for treatment and one third progressed to treatment. Mm -hmm. um, now that the numbers are more like 2000, how would you say that that breakdown is? Yeah, so we looked at that when we saw that, you know, when you go out to about seven years, about 40%, um, you know, we used to say, yeah, three, you know, 30% of five years, 50% of 10, he still says that. Uh, most of the time. Our numbers when we go out to seven years within this new cohort that we're looking at, um, it's about a 69% uh, treatment-free survival. So about 40% went on to treatment by seven years. You know, And this is because, again, we're looking at not just our Gleason 6s anymore, but also these three fours with low volume Gleason 4 um, within that subset. So you know, going out a couple more years from now, we can look back at that specific subset as well and kind of add that in there. But it looks to be on about the same trend. You know, you were hinting at, or you had mentioned um, um, anxiety. How, you know, how big a factor is anxiety in uh, men dropping out of active surveillance? Are there specific numbers on that? Yeah. Um, you know, I kind of, when I talk about anxiety, I also talk about kind of comfort with the idea of having a cancer remain in your body. And then comfort with the idea of serial biopsies and serial MRIs and blood tests. And I think that's not an insignificant number of men. You know, we haven't specifically tried to assess that out in our active surveillance cohort with surveys or focus groups and what that number would be. But anecdotally, even just that becomes a large part of the discussion about active surveillance for quite a few men, um, you know, at UCSF that we see kind of every single time, to be honest. I was talking to an epidemiologist uh, at Erasmus uh, Medical Center mm -hmm. in Rotterdam, uh, Netherlands, and uh, she told me that um, that about, I, th I think, 50% of men eventually drop out of active surveillance. I forget if it's in five years or whatever. Yeah. And, and of those 50%, half or 25% of the whole, you know, have anxiety issues. And so their their focus is on trying to address anxiety, you know, to try to keep men into yeah. in, in active surveillance, I, I wonder it, at your program, do you do you have uh, any any specific um, ways of addressing anxiety? And let me let me add one other thing too. She, she they 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 have a multidisciplinary approach in the Netherlands and also in Italy, and you know so they'll have a team with with a nurse, a urologist. A, uh, radiation oncologist, but they also include a psychologist. I, I wonder if you're doing anything like that, or is that a reasonable approach? Uh, it totally is a reasonable approach. Um, you know, everyone throughout the kind of diagnostic step and determining the initial management sees the other 
our partners in kind of this multidisciplinary approach, but psycho-oncology is another aspect that I think we could do more of. And because we lean heavily now currently on support groups as a way to kind of help with that anxiety and get men to kind of um, where they're comfortable with active surveillance, if that's truly what they want to do. Um, but do we work it into kind of our protocol for every patient? Not yet. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's a great idea. I think it's very important. Yeah, well, there's a, you know, a study coming out of uh, Netherlands and, mm -hmm. and Italy uh, at the European meeting this year that she is telling okay. me about. I'll be happy to share it with you. I think she sent yeah. me the abstract. But, um, you know, do, at UCSF, do you, do you also have a multidisciplinary approach? We do. So our standard policy is anyone that gets diagnosed, we kind of send them over to our radiation oncologists and they obviously see us. Um, they're localized disease to talk with both before making a decision. Right? And that's just kind of our routine approach to most men with clinically localized prostate cancer. Those with metastatic disease, obviously, you know, that we include medical mm -hmm. as well in that um, as part of the discussion. But we definitely try to make sure that they are making informed decisions so they can meet everything. Right? It doesn't all happen during the same clinic encounter. We to try to make sure that happens before they make a decision. What kind of uh, focal uh, treatment do you guys have available or that you would lean towards? Or Yeah, we started uh, introducing high food. Um, high intensity frequency, you know, focal ultrasound uh, within uh, our group here at uh, UCSF. Prior to that, we've been using cryoablation in select patients, but less so in the active surveillance setting. Um, but particularly in those men who are on active surveillance where they have just one focus of more aggressive disease, we've been talking about how can HIFU focal therapy in some form in that setting be beneficial for these men. So I may be. You a proponent of high food? Sorry. Are you a proponent of high food? I'm not against it. I okay. think it definitely has a use. I think it, you know, it's a new. It's a. I think it's an exciting opportunity. We just have to find the right patients for it, and then know how to manage it and kind of monitor it. And how would you identify the right patients for that? Yeah, so a lot of it has to do with the sampling beforehand. So we're sure, to the best of our knowledge, that there is just one area or one region of high-grade disease and benign or Gleason 3.3 in the other areas, right? To use our kind of focal high-intensity ultrasound waves to kind of cook that area of the prostate and leave the rest on its own. Hopefully I dealt with that what is high food question uh, that came up in the chat. Well, you know, another way to maybe answer it is it's a partial gland treatment. It's focused, it's focal, as opposed to a radical prostatectomy, which is obliterating, is the idea. So the whole it's, it's focal. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you also had brought up some issues with African-American men, and uh, we're going to be having a webinar on... Uh, I think June 29th, we're going to have a Canadian man who's been on active surveillance. He's, he's Caribbean Canadian, uh, and he's had five years of pushback from other people in his community who basically say uh, active surveillance isn't for us, us being uh, black men. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he he's going to be speaking. We're going to have a Dr. Underwood, who's a, I don't know if you know Willie Underwood, but he's, yeah, yeah. He's, on our, he's on our panel. He's on the board of the AMA, but he's not speaking for the AMA. Uh, he's speaking as a black man and as a urologist and as a black urologist. Yeah. And he, I think he was more in the inter, favorable intermediate group, but he opted for, uh, you know, radical. He sort of said, well, you wouldn't expect me to do radiation because, you know, my thing is surgery. But, you know, he does not encourage men to go on active surveillance. Um, and then our third uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Mayhall, uh, who's, 
who's actually an Indian American, uh, but he's done a lot of research, you know, on on this. But you know, is a is a a black man, is a black, <laughs> black urologist, and is a urologist. You know, what what is your advice for black men? I think, you know, at the end of the day, there's been enough data out to show underutilization of actor surveillance in men who would be candidates, right? Um, but I think looking at race alone is kind of an incomplete way to look at this, right? Because there are a lot of other things that contribute to the stage at which men present, particularly African-American men. So timing and delays in diagnosis, delays in treatment, that led to the uh, the um, concerns about the safety of active surveillance in African American men. But there's been enough data, even a multi-institutional retrospective study that came out in cancer in the last month that showed in men who are on active surveillance protocols and are managed with those protocols appropriately, there were no difference in outcomes, including survival and adverse pathology. So I think a lot of this, not all of it, is definitely multifactorial. But there are aspects of this that can be directly intervened upon by the urologist and how active surveillance is implemented and how diagnosis is performed and reducing some of the barriers. So if you get an Af African-American man at the right time, it can be safe. If you surveil them actively, it can be safe. No, uh, Jim Schrate, um, you, yeah. you, yeah, you I, have I, a better I, turn. I, I had a quick question or two for you. From your research, uh, can you conclude that overtreatment is alive and well, at least in certain parts of the country? And then secondly, do you have any advice to what we as patient advocates, be it ANCAN, US2, or zero, might do to most effectively address this? Is it uh, patient education? Is it trying to uh, get the attention of AUA? or what what do you think might be effective in addressing this uh, and what can we do yeah so i'd say all of the above right because i think even urologists in the research that is done focus on the patient and kind of miss the other side of the coin which is the system of which i'm a part of and how that impacts the treatment right so i definitely think there i mean our research and other research has shown that over treatments still happening in places but there are kind of broader efforts to get urologists their data back to them so they have an idea of what's happening. And I think that's one aspect. Patient advocacy and education so patients are informed is definitely key. Particularly if you're with a urologist who may not believe that active surveillance is appropriate. And for some men that may be true, but for others they may be great candidates for active surveillance. So I think that's another facet. I think broadly for our field overall, we see not only in prostate cancer, but in bladder and others, adherence to guidelines um, can be variable, right? And a lot of that's based not just on the disease, but social factors, regional factors, it was, as we've seen here. So a lot of this, I, again, I would say is kind of done at the local level. Broadly, we can push for urologists to uptake active surveillance, patients to be advocates. But some of the nitty gritty details may be specific for San Francisco, different for Oakland, different for Houston, where I grew up, right? Things like that. That makes sense? Yeah, it does. It, it makes it sound like a much more difficult problem, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that we're trying to do is, is educate support group leaders on active surveillance issues and, and really put something out into the local communities where these guys are on the front lines. You know, unfortunately, we have patients coming to support groups such as this, um, not at the time of diagnosis, but a, a after treatment. So, you know, it's it's really uh, it's something that I, I guess I view as, as uh, increasing the reach and the outreach of, of, of patient support, peer support. And, I totally and, hopefully at some point making that part of the standard of care. I totally agree. And I know that there are ongoing efforts to kind of look at a practice level across the country, the uptake of active surveillance, right? But that requires a, a level of data infrastructure that just wasn't there 10 years ago, right? So you could do it in Capture, you could do it at UCSF or Hopkins, 
because they, you know, put 10 years worth of time into that infrastructure, right, right. you know, that just wasn't available in other places. But I totally agree that, you know, a man with low risk disease, irrespective of race, should at least have a discussion about active surveillance. Right? I don't think, you know, does that mean if I'm diagnosed with low risk disease, I should go into prostatectomy? No, I'd want a discussion of active surveillance, right? To at least know if I'm a candidate or not. You know, Sam, you mentioned um, some sort of support group at uh, UCSF and, uh, excuse me, uh, Jim and Joe and I have had an opportunity recently to observe uh, some of the people who run support groups. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of them are, are still in their minds from 20 years ago when they were treated and right. maybe subconsciously or, well, maybe they're just not informed about active surveillance. I mean, they're running a group for everybody. Yeah. Uh, this is an unusual group here because it's about active surveillance. But I, I just wonder, you know, what is your impression of the support network? And does your, your groups, or are your groups at UCSF, are they somehow trained or monitored? Yeah, I think, you know, overall, I still believe support groups can be more beneficial even than just the 15 minute, 30 minute, hour long conversation a patient could have with me, right? Just to help patients see other people going through the same thing is incredibly important. I think the value of a support group inviting people like myself or Dr. Underwood or others is to get that perspective from practitioners on what's currently happening in our field. So it's kind of like an update to patients who were treated 10 years ago. Things have changed in the last 10 years, right? But there's no way to expect patients to keep up on all the literature of what's going on. So I think having that kind of new input or influx of updated information and about practice and what's changed, what technology could be beneficial is immensely helpful. And you start to see that in some of the support groups, those in San Francisco and in East Bay, where they have speakers come in and talk about different aspects of urologic care, including prostate cancer management. And that becomes just an educational opportunity and an empowering um, opportunity for men who are still making these decisions, right? kind of in a vacuum in some cases. Hey, Jim? Hmm? No, I, I didn't have anything else right now. Oh, okay. Because I got a note saying you're ready. <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you, well, I, I have something else if you don't. Um, you know, there's an old debate that's coming up again, which is whether Gleason uh, 6 should even be considered a cancer. I, I know people like Dr. Epstein, the pathologist, you know, says it, it looks like a cancer, so it's a cancer. And then uh, pe people like Dr. Egner and Dr. Klotz, say, yeah, it, it looks like a cancer, but it doesn't act like a cancer. And I know where Dr. Carroll stands, but I, I wanna hear where you stand. Uh, I would not go up against any of them, the giants in the field, but I would say that like, um, if it's true Gleason 3.3, I would not be doing surgery on those patients based on their Gleason score alone, right? There are patients who come in who have Gleason 3.3 and we talk, we say, you know, is this likely to change if we've done adequate sampling and there's no Gleason 4 component? It seems unlikely, but we'll do MRIs and genomics and that will kind of reassure us as well um, in some of those men. And then some of them just don't, you know, have to come to terms with the idea of that being present in their prostate. And that's a part that's kind of independent of the Gleason grade or the stage. Um, and another important factor, kind of in that decision point of active surveillance versus that treatment. If that answers your question in a roundabout way. Uh, in other words, you're dodging. Okay. Quite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go up yeah. against Fox or Epstein or Carol. No, 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 no. Yeah, we're going to be having uh, a debate coming up uh, in July. Uh, with Dr. Egner and uh, the head of pathology at uh, Tufts. 
I forget if for, I'm blocking on his name right now. So we, but let me push another button for you. Um, transrectal versus transperineal. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of talk in, in this group, in other groups that I go to, and things are actually kind of heating up on the patient side from this. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're you know, are you at uh, UCSF thinking about making a change? I mean, there's new technology that uh, the, that changes the equation for transperineal so that it can be done in, um, you know, in, in the office rather than the operating room. Yeah, yeah. I think it's definitely being discussed. Um, I haven't heard anything, you know, about us having a practice-wide change to date. Um, but I know the benefits in terms of, you know, in terms of discomfort, infection risks afterwards, and they're valuable. So I think it definitely has a place. Will it completely overtake transrectal ultrasound? I think it may hit some resistance just with urologists kind of across the country. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I shared with you something about a urologist I, yeah. I'm related to. <laughs> uh, so, now, Gary Grimm is asking, uh, in active surveillance, is it appropriate to do a decipher uh, type test after each biopsy, or is it just uh, one okay uh, and guidance even with several biopsies? So, I don't know if. No, if so I'm it's a good question. Yeah, because we actually looked at that using uh, Oncotype DX, so GPS scores over time. And we found that with serial genomic testing, it was really the most recent genomic test that was uh, associated with upgrade or change from active surveillance to treatment. So there is value there of repeating those. I'd say no one, you know, we always talk about what that interval should be between treating, um, between uh, biopsies and between testing. And as we try to widen that interval, it'll be interesting to see where that falls out. But there's definitely uh, clinical value in updating some of these tests, right, including the genomics. So let's see, any more questions from the crowd? Sure, I was just gonna ask, I was just gonna ask uh, Sam, as long as we have him here, and he mentioned uh, Houston. So if you, if you were making a recommendation to somebody in Houston, uh, so where would you recommend them? Oh, uh, oh man, I left when I was, I left for college, never went back. But, uh, you know, I would definitely, most people would go to MD Anderson. You know, if you are concerned, you want to know kind of what's the latest and greatest going on there. I think there are a lot of places, and I know personally people down there um, in private practice around Houston um, who are kind of up to date on the things that are going on. So I think, um, but you know, I am well, also biased because I'm from an academic center. Because uh, because of this group um, and uh, their encouragement, I, I've moved to MD Anderson. So another question that I guess I would ask is, and it relates to what Howard talked about anxiety and what have you. I think I think a group like this is is incredible uh, for people that have anxiety. Yeah. Um, I did not hear about this group from any uh, anybody in the health profession. I I found out about this group um, only from pure hearsay of talking to other people and, and that. And well, you know, Hugh, this is an imaginary group. We're actually yeah. actually a figment of your imagination. No, uh, it's it's virtual, Howard, not imaginary. <laughs> no, it's both. It's both, Jim. Oh, but, okay. but it, it so you know it does kind of. Uh, I do find it interesting that you know nobody, nobody in my health group has recommended this group or or, or other groups that are out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we kind of need to work on because I would say when it comes to decision making, education, comfort with the provider. You know, in those person to person interactions and communication have been shown to be immensely important in the decision making process. 
and more importantly, to avoid decisional regret after the decision's been made. Right? So the worst thing that we can do is someone decide treatment and then afterwards say, I wish I never got this. Right? Sure. And you'll see that that happens not with these large data sets that we've been using NCDB, SEER, and others. That happens with the smaller focus group qualitative studies that are really diving into the communication aspects that we can't get from these SEER data. Right? But that's another layer. I mean, this whole thing, there's so many layers. So, you know, I say you can't look outside and say all the blue cars are broken, right? That doesn't help. That doesn't change anything. You can't do anything based on that. You're gonna change all the blue cars. You need more details, right? Make a model what happened. So um, I, you know, we really have to dive deeper in order to intervene to make bigger impact. I, I I actually do have a quick question. I, I wasn't gonna come back on, but um, we welcomed um, Larry Fong last week, who um, I also have the distinct pleasure of knowing very, very well, and, and he is just a wonderful dog. And we asked him not just to give a pre presentation on immunotherapy as it pertains to prostate cancer, but to focus on whether there's a place for immunotherapy in lower risk disease, not just in late and end stage disease. Mm -hmm. And he did address that and he talked, um, he talked about the study they did around 2010, I remember it really well about how they found uh, dendritic cells circling the, the tumor in men with low risk disease when, in, in, or intermediate risk disease when they did um, prostatectomies. And he said, he mentioned that they're waiting now on a, um, the results of a study for Provenge for men with, um, without, who were on active surveillance and to see if the Provenge made any difference. So my question to you is, um, from where you sit, do you see a role for immunotherapy in, in active surveillance and low risk disease and intermediate maybe? Well, that is tough, that is tough. I could see it particularly in intermediate risk disease, right? I would say, you know, going back to the question earlier about men with Gleason 6, I would be hesitant to do anything like that for that group, right? They're truly Gleason 6. But if we're talking about they're on surveillance and they're thinking about treatments, I definitely think it's worth questioning our paradigm to see if there are other possible treatment modalities available. Right? If that's my dodgy answer to that question. Well, um, if you if you like, and the guys will give it to you. We'll, we'll send you the uh, we'll send you Larry's presentation. Yeah. Oh, I have to put my money down one way or the other. <laughs> uh, no, but you might just be interested to hear what he had to say about yeah. um, on on low risk. Yeah. But, yeah. We I should mention that uh, we're, we're going to have it a meeting. I think in August, uh, Dr. Shore, who's uh, doing some research uh, with immunotherapy with Provenge in uh, low-risk men. So we, you know, we're we're going to get at this question one way or another. Um, now, I, there is I did get a question here from John, who is saying if it is a true Gleason six. Does having a high volume make a difference relative to active surveillance instead of treatment? So what you know, what is a true Gleason six? Is that is that a technical term or is that just something you made up? No, no. So I'm just alluding to the fact that we didn't. It, there wasn't uh, undersampling, so it wasn't that we just missed a dominant tumor or a, a kind of a focus of more aggressive disease. So say we have a prostate with, you know, two grams of Gleason 6 and nothing else. And we have another prostate with six grams of Gleason 6 and nothing else. You know, I think there are many of us would treat those the same with just active surveillance. I'm just alluding to the fact that just making sure that we haven't just missed an area of like Gleason 4 just due to sampling. I got it, but, 
Okay, if you have somebody that's Gleason six, how how important is is the volume question? It is, it makes a difference. Yeah, it definitely kind of ties into, and it's part of our CAPRA, our nomogram, looking at age, race, PSA, T stage, and volume of cores positive. Um, but um, it wouldn't be if it's all Gleason six. That alone um, wouldn't be an absolute trigger for active surveillance for a uh, treatment. Yep. I had another question about anxiety. You know, we're focused on uh, men on thinking about or on active surveillance or thinking about leaving active surveillance. Yeah. But I want to wonder about the men with more, you know, more advanced disease who undergo radiotherapy or surgery, you know, what is the anxiety level in those men? Is it, is it different? Is it less of a lingering thing? So let's say, you know, when they're trying to decide between treatment options, the areas that we kind of talk about the most are erectile function, well, survival for one, um, and then erectile function and continence afterwards. Um, so a lot of it, is just the impact of treatment versus radiation in those domains um, and how comfortable people are with surgery as opposed in taking out the prostate as opposed to radiation and leaving the prostate in and that's where i see a kind of quite a bit of variation um, in terms of what people decide a very personal kind of decision but you know in terms in terms of uh, the anxiety issue, what I hear, I, I mean, I think I've had two days of anxiety in 10 years. You know, I, I read the studies and I and I was a believer mm -hmm. instantly. Um, it, but, you know, I'm just wondering, um, well, a lot of these guys tell me, you know, now that I'm starting to ask, that every time they're up for a PSA, they get anxious. Every time yeah. they're up to see see somebody like you, uh, a urologist, they get anxious. And yeah. you know, I had I had no idea, you know. Um, it, but I I wonder again about the guys that have more definitive treatment. I mean, they must have a lot of anxiety in their decision making process, mm. but. But once they've made that choice and once they've fin finished that process, do they still get anxiety or maybe depression? And what's the difference anyway? Well, I think it all ties in, especially with something else I mentioned earlier, which was decisional regret. So a lot of it depends on what happens after treatment, right? Um, and some of that depends on counseling and education before treatment in terms of expectations of what's going to happen after surgery, after radiation. Um, but there is quite a bit of people with anxiety about what that first PSA is going to be after surgery or what their next PSA is going to be in a year or what's going to happen to their PSA after radiation. Is it going to fall all the way down or is, where is it going to nadir? Um, and it's a constant thing um, that we always talk about um, because it's that important and that impactful. Um, you know, I would say most guys that I've seen post-treatment have some form of, you know, I wouldn't call it clinically, you know, diagnosed depression, but a level of concern and anxiousness about the PSA after treatment, right? And I think some of that's just appropriate, like they're caring about what happens to them afterwards. And, you know, with anxiety issues, you know, uh, how big a role do spouses and partners and children and other relatives play in this. I mean, you know, our, you know, I sometimes think that the men are being, um, you know, put down and, you know, like the spouse is saying, well, you just want to pre preserve your sex life or you don't want to wear diapers. And, uh, you know, that, that's what this is about. What you should really be doing is trying to save your life with definitive treatment. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to address that exactly. Well, I would say, you know, um, studies that even have looked at just uptake of PSA screening 
when they talk to the significant other, the partner, they see men are more receptive to uptake of like even PSA screening, right? So I think a lot of us incorporate that better half, whoever that person is, or those family members, just to help this person make the decision, come to terms with the fact that he has to make this decision. Um, I think it's important. It can definitely swing both ways. I've seen less than constructive interactions, um, but most of them have been supportive in terms of the people that come with them to visits or in these days show up on the Zoom call um, during these visits and these discussions. And Jim, were, were you raising your hand? Yeah, <laughs> Howard, this is Joe. I was just thinking, you know, we've we've kept the doctor a little bit over time now. Um, maybe we can get get some uh, closing comments. Well, first of all, um, answer the questionnaire, or my firstborn will die. Um, so, so please answer the questionnaire. And then, uh, secondly, um, I want to thank Sam for coming by and visiting with us and informing us. And when he gets a little bit older, he won't be dodging so many questions <laughs> because he'll be, he'll be in charge. I need a couple of grades first. I need a couple of grades. Yeah, I, I think, I think he did, he did an excellent job of keeping the kids out away too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Congratulations on that. Yeah, you like, can probably uh, hear them a little bit. That's fine. Um, but we, should, we, so thank you, and you know we can uh, release you. So it was great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Really, really thank appreciate you. it. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the good information. Thanks. Perfect. Have a good night. Okay. Good, good night. night. I'd like my team to hang on, post that. Okay, Howard, boss. See, Howard, see if you can hit the record button, please. Okay. Uh, there was a, let's see, is it closed now? I think I can, let me see. I'm trying to hit it, but it was oh, not. Oh, it's paused for some reason. Yeah, click click it, and it should give you a drop down for stop recording. Uh, it says there's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, in in that in that case, what we will do is uh, we can uh, shut this call down, and then we can uh, reconvene in the Barniscus room if we would please. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thanks a lot.